bit. We'll get the technology bit working. In a sec. Right, excellent. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Epic. Um, lovely to be here again. Um, so, uh, yeah, I spoke at uh, the 2019 Epic, and I guess my brief here is to give you a bit of a, an update on, uh, on life from Whistle um, and my observations of what has happened this year. A year where, indeed, it has been proved that everything is possible, um, even that we should all end up as sort of uh, bit part actors in, in a sort of global catastrophe movie, some, something out of Hollywood. Who knew? that um, this was going to happen. So um, let me take you through my observations and um, apologies because I'm, I'm starting with a really dull slide and I hate starting with a cred slide, but actually um, the only reason to, to show you this is actually to describe and to illustrate the impact that COVID-19 has had on our business. So this is our business, this is where we operate um, broadly in the postal space, the delivery space, the connecting people brand space, I suppose you'd say. Um, and you know we were a business sort of split um, between sort of uh, print-based media, so direct marketing, direct mail, door drop media, which is obviously my sort of particular passion. Um, and our experience of the pandemic was, was um, certainly initially at least, um, very broadly aligned to much of advertising, entirely negative. Uh, you know, Q2 hit and it was just a uh, disaster city. I mean, it was just you know, a wasteland of stuff, cancel book campaigns, everything in turmoil um yeah it, it was pretty pretty much uh, cataclysmic it's fair to say so i won't make any bones about it i'm gonna try and dress it up it was a, a disaster um uh, you know the flip side of that is our other side of our business um is is sort of in parcels e-commerce fulfillment warehousing pick pack and all the rest of it um unsurprisingly and, and to echo what uh, olga said earlier today yep that's been that's been doing rather well um so <laughs> Uh, Christmas started somewhere around the 16th of March for, for that to, that part of our business um, and hasn't stopped. Only now we're actually facing a real Christmas on top of everything else. Um, but it has been a year of superlatives um, in you know biggest, highest volumes, um, you know, and, and all the rest of it throughout this year. It just hasn't stopped. So yes, I mean, you know, we have seen some texture within that. And uh, again, illustrating kind of a point that sort of Olga made around the behaviour change. Um, absolutely, we are seeing consistency in this. Yes, across the summer months when things slightly relaxed and we had a bit more sort of uh, freedom, shall we say, uh, we did definitely see um, a decrease in our sort of parcel traffic, but only around about 10% versus the height of lockdown versus sort of the uh, April, May period where uh, we were you know, running at three times sort of previous years. So. Yeah, still, we've been ahead, obviously, massively ahead of any forecast or plan or any wildest dreams in this area since um, COVID hit. But yes, I mean, you know, there was a small sort of dip across the summer months because of people uh, perhaps having other options back to, re to conventional retail. But nevertheless, um, it's continued pretty much unabated. So I do believe that some of the behaviour change that we've seen will stick, will, will, uh, will not go away. But yes, just to sort of pick up really on more of the advertising conversation, which is of course you know my day job. And 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 back in April, um, the Advertising Association and uh, Walk published this rather gloomy uh, sort of projection on what they thought was going to happen across 2020, which was double-digit declines across the board, including interestingly enough, even digital, even sort of the digital channels, which have been just an unstoppable runaway juggernaut of success over the last several years throughout the sort of worst of the recessions, throughout the worst of anything that the last decade has thrown at them, their growth has continued unabated. But even, even they cannot sort of uh, hold out against sort of the cataclysm of, of COVID. So it's, um, that was the sort of forecast back in April. Um, updated slightly in Q3, in Q3 with the um, IPA's Bellwether report, which is basically produced from a consultation with lots of marketing departments, marketing heads, um, to sort of get a view on what they're planning for their own brands. Um, and as you can see, again, broadly, the picture is at least, if not more negative than back 2008, 2009, sort of the, high, the sort of global uh, credit crunch crisis. 
um, you know, we're, we're sort of plumbing new depths and again, hitting perhaps superlatives the wrong way um, in that sort of space. The, um, the downward revision of marketing budgets continues, reflecting obviously consumer confidence. Um, but uh, against that backdrop, the industry has thrown up some very interesting headlines, which I just wanted to take a moment to dwell on. Quite conflicting and opposing headlines in actual fact, because um, we heard a lot of it just now um, about this digital transformation effect, how we've moved forward in a matter of months, a matter of, you know, it's sort of something equivalent to five years in terms of, sort of growth. And of course, it's very easy to say, well, yes, I acknowledge that we've gone to e-commerce, but for this then to become a proxy of marketing behavior uh, and to sort of accelerate what was already a, a, a very, very advanced sort of push towards sort of ever more digital advertising. You know, it's already gone to the point where it's over half of everything um, in advertising in the UK. This looks like it was only going to push it further. Um, but then you also have sort of some quite contrary thinking, which is interesting. So WALK, the World Advertising Research Council, announces actually that, you know, there are three big um, kind of uh, mortal threats, three horsemen of the apocalypse stalking the advertising industry. Brexit, of course. COVID, yes, of course. But interestingly, they put the tech giants in that sort of uh, rather sort of dismal league. Um, and that reflects, I think, increasing concerns about the way that Facebook and Google have begun to really dominate um, the advertising sort of arena, which is having lots of unforeseen and um, unrequested con uh, consequences. One of which is actually that the uh, trust in marketing is reaching you know, new lows, um, as the articles here state, um, you know, fake book, claims it can reach more young people than exist in the UK, US and other countries. So, um, you know, their ability to invent audiences is, is, is obviously now widely reported. Um, and of course, you know, since Cambridge Analytica, the data scandal, they are now the least trusted um, brand um, in the digital ecosystem by some country mile, 40% of consumers say they don't um, trust Facebook. And a recent survey just published actually last week from Ipsos Mori, has now <laughs> just demonstrates the, the depths to which we have plumbed that uh, the the well, they've looked at job roles and the different sort of industries and uh, asked consumers which is the least trusted um, and, and unfortunately in this year's survey the advertising executive has dipped to the uh, an all-time low of the worst role the worst job the worst industry we are unbelievably below politicians at this moment in time. And that to me is, is, is devastating. So that just demonstrates exactly how far it's gone. Now, okay, if you're if you're fake book, you might think, well there, so what? The billions keep rolling in. So, uh, you know, they'll laugh in the face of stuff like this, I guess. But why does it matter? Well, I think it matters because actually, uh, consumers are beginning to get wise to this um, and realize that they actually don't blame Facebook, they're beginning to apportion this blame to the brands themselves. They're basically saying, look, this is no longer new stuff. You should have worked out these problems. You should understand how this stuff works. You should not be making these god awful gaps that could become you know, front page headlines. And again, to the sort of uh, looking at the sort of generational spit on this, the, the younger that you are, the more likely you have a higher expectation that brands will have got their act together and sorted this stuff out. So this is from the Edelman Trust Barometer, you know, a useful resource for me. I always have it at my fingertips. But I mean, this one is, is definitely a compelling uh, and quite, if you're a brand, I think quite a scary story um, as to why it does actually matter what happens in your online advertising. So with that backdrop, I just wanted to spend the rest of the presentation really focusing in on three key trends that I see have, um, have evolved throughout this mad old year of 2020. Um, so I'll go through each of these in turn, but the first is to say, perhaps stating the bleeding obvious, that media is absolutely all mixed up at the moment. It's an extraordinary um, sort of circumstance. I'm gonna to touch on digital fatigue. I think it's there. I think there's some good solid evidence for that. And I also reflect on how life has become infinitely more local over the course of 2020 and some of the uh, impacts that we're going to see as a result of that okay so the, but yes to mixed up media there's no doubt about it <clears throat> as you saw in the um projections across the different channels this has been um a year like no other um and you know it, it's changed the whole conversation the whole media conversation it's changed the whole media context more importantly because <clears throat> actually nowadays um in 2020 even now even today that you know the day we leave lockdown 
in the in England at least, the um, reality of life is the media context is not here in our city centres. Uh, out of uh, out of home advertising posters, you know, to you and I, it has had a god awful year. I mean, you know, people just have not been around. It has not been here that people are, you know, spending their their advertising money. It's not here either. You know, the transport networks and systems, which obviously also suck up a lot of advertising spend, you know, they've been decimated by this whole crisis as well. Definitely, cinema. I mean, you know, probably the most significantly impacted media channel this year, arguably, um, with cinemas closed, remaining closed in large parts of the country, the blockbusters shifting out of uh, 2020, some of them in a sort of slightly existential space. Um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely not where, where the action is. And um, absolutely not at festivals and events. And I don't know if you're like me, but maybe I've just been kind of too indoctrinated by this, but <clears throat> my skin like, starts to crawl slightly and look at all those people jammed together. <laughs> it's a very antithesis of social distancing. I hope we can get back there soon, but at the moment, that image is slightly awkward to look at, I think. So yes, these are media contexts where historically large chunks of advertising money have been spent um, and are not currently being spent. And in that media ferment, actually, yes, of course, you know, there are issues and there are challenges, but there are also, of course, opportunities. And not here either, uh, for many brands at least, of course, uh, 2020 amidst everything else was the year of Black Lives Matter, the year of the US presidential election, and the year of the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. Um, and this is where Facebook really did begin to get um, you know, challenged on, on every level, actually, not just in terms of you know, the regulatory conversation, which still hasn't actually happened, and but will obviously begin to continue in the coming years. And I think we get out of crime one crisis um, and really hopefully into another, but I mean, we'll get into that sort of conversation again. It'll come back to becoming a, a, a more mainstream topic. But across the summer months, of course, you know, many global advertisers stopped, boycotted Facebook. They stopped advertising on Facebook um, as a result of obviously their stance on, uh, on hate, on Trump and all the rest of it. They um, and of course, Facebook has also suffered significantly from the fact that um, most of its revenues, quite frankly, come from small and medium advertisers globally. The sheer number of those far outweighs the spend that comes from the big brands with the big marketing budgets. But nevertheless, they were squeezed on both sides because many of those businesses were either shut or indeed were gone, were unfortunately have kind of closed. So, you know, it has not been a particularly great year for Facebook, it must be said, which, uh, you know, alongside Google, as I say, represents the vast majority of uh, marketing budgets on this planet. Yeah, I mean, undoubtedly, drum roll, please, the winner of Media Context of the Year is our home, um, because <laughs> fundamentally, it's where we've been most of the time in this room, uh, not all of you. Um, but I mean, the reality of life is our homes have become our offices, our schools, <laughs> restaurants, um, you know, just about everything for us. Uh, and perhaps then it's, you know, when you look at it in that context, it's not an entire surprise as to why channels that speak to people in their homes have actually seen a significant sort of reversal of fortunes since that initial lockdown. And you hear a lot about the way that um, you know conventional TV watching has come back and advertising watching on television has has increased. You'll hear a lot about sort of radio. People listen to radio in their home, but of course direct marketing, uh, direct mail, letters, door drops, catalogues, brochures, things received in the home has been a way to find and connect with audiences at this time. And so then we come into the fact that you know there's this other trend so there's that sort of contextual trend then we have this digital fatigue um which i think is I mean, we are the vast majority of us working from home are spending a very significant amount of our time glued to our screens quite frankly the thought of spending any more time you know digitally um at the end of the day relaxing is an anathema to us at the moment or for a lot of people you know that's why actually you know switching to um watching some live television or reading you know a book or direct marketing or whatever it is has actually become a more a more favored pastime um and there are definitely some key trends that i think will illustrate that the first which comes out of our uh, industry research body jigmail um speaks very very loudly to the fact that 
activity that did maintain its um, sort of presence in a home, uh, those brands who continued bravely to spend, and there were many, I mean, you know, it wasn't a complete wipeout in, in Q2 during the first lockdown, um, were rewarded by some absolutely, you know, unprecedented uh, metrics. We saw the best ever reports from Jigmail in terms of the number of times that items were looked at, the number of commercial actions that were driven from them, and the length of time that they stayed in that home. That sort of 6.9 days is the average length of time that a door drop item in Q2, the lockdown quarter, remained in the home. And that's quite extraordinary. And it's extraordinary, particularly when you compare that to the sort of absolutely ephemeral, fleeting, nanosecond nature of, of digital marketing. Um, uh, these stats are Facebook's own stats, um, and they represent the amount of time of any piece of advertising content is spent, you know, that people spend with a piece of advertising content in their newsfeed. Now, on a laptop or desktop, that's about 2.5 seconds. Or on a mobile, that's 1.7 seconds. So these are Facebook's own stats. That's how long you've got. So just to sort of illustrate what that looks like, um, there's this. And, and then there's this. Now, I'm, it would be silly. I'm, I'm not going to wait 6.9 days. Um, I might just lose a few of you. But, um, but you know, I, I just fancied having a bit of an alarmist Morissette moment in my uh, presentation. But I think when we start getting down to brass tacks and looking at results and looking at the context of how people are engaging with this, the way that audiences and people, real people in their homes are really behaving with content, um, some very interesting comparisons come up. And the first thing you'll hear, of course, and we're all used to it in the print industry, the first thing you'll hear is, oh, but it's so much more expensive. And it is, yes, absolutely. Um, and for those of us who um, aspire to being something other than simply cheap, um, it is more expensive. And in fact, specifically in this example, 20 times more expensive. So you can understand, perhaps, on that metric, the initial attraction of digital marketing. Um, but actually, for their money, pound for pound, print is offering a significant amount of more content. You know, we've got an image dwelled on for 1.7 seconds, occupying kind of space, equating to subject to your you know, mobile screen size, about six to eight sort of centimeters in, in sort of uh, space. Comparing that with 24 pages of, of print, you know, with, with all the variety and the content and the inspiration that comes with that. The moments that you can't search for because you didn't know you wanted to be a it in the brochure. Um, so you've got more space, more content, and comparing the 1.7 seconds with 6.9 days, about 350,000 times more opportunity to see, by my reckoning. So, you know, I, cost has always been one of those sticks to beat the print industry with, but now more than ever, we are equipped and armed with metrics to challenge that and demonstrate real value, real sustained and considerable value versus, as I say, these nanosecond moments um, in, in pixels. And it's not just the sort of theory. In practice, this is also happening. So this is some analysis from a media agency on, on Facebook's performance during lockdown. Um, and you can see the baseline that they had from prior years that they were sort of running at. They had a sort of steady sort of uh, view on the sort of effectiveness of Facebook. And you can see that that has you know, quite significantly impact, been impacted over the lockdown months. This is looking through to August, actually, when this tracker ends. And they've never yet attained the same level of performance that they had prior to lockdown. So for anybody who says, oh, well, it's all gone digital, hasn't it, in lockdown, please don't believe them for a second. The data does, does not support that theory. So, you know, performance is down. Trust is growing. Mistrust is growing. Um, regulatory issues are on the horizon. Don't get me wrong. I don't think I'm not one of those people who, who sit here thinking COVID-19 has changed the world forever. We're never going back. It's never going to be the same again. Things have changed subtly. They will change back, but never, maybe not exactly to where it is. But I don't see that the next few years are particularly glorious. Have any more um, good news for sort of digital marketing? Because I think, as commentators have elsewhere reported, that actually 2019 was probably the year of peak digital before they actually had to start operating on a level playing field and start sort of uh, 
playing by the rules that the rest of marketing plays by. And again, just to sort of evidence, if Facebook's had a, a poor year in terms of performance, our channels have not. Um, this is a report from one of our e regular e-commerce retail customers, so a pure play digital brand using print. Don't we love those opportunities? Um, so they have used it for a while. They know it's an effective media for them in terms of driving um, new client acquisition. Um, and this year, in the highest of lockdown, April 2020, they ran a door drop campaign, which they had previously run a, a, another example sort of on the same seasonality, so April 2019. And their reports tell us that the comparison in terms of response was that they had a 41% improvement in their response rate 2020 versus 2019. Not much else different, same season, same time, very similar creative and offer. Primarily, what we're seeing here is the difference that audiences in their homes have made. Okay. And I always say this, I say this all the time. I'm using this phrase repeatedly ad nauseum, I'm sure. But um, when you think about your audiences at home, we are always at home, all of us. It's never not been a good place to try to reach people. Okay. It's always been there as an opportunity. It has just unfortunately taken a global pandemic to frame that media environment, perhaps in a more favorable light. And we've seen so many new customers come to us this year. So many customers challenged by the changes in media, what they can and can't do, global restrictions on Facebook advertising, <clears throat> or um, or just pragmatic sort of uh, I can't you know spend in this festival or on this out of out of home site as I used to. In that opportunity, getting people over the line, we've accelerated conversations that might have taken several years. We've jumped forward in that time period faster than we would ever would have before. And by force of having to trial us, they're gonna find that they like a lot of what they see in this channel. And I believe a lot of that spend will stay into 2021. So the last trend, just to touch on it, is you know life has just got more local. I mean, I think we've all been locked down. We've all been in our local environments. The way in which our local retailers, our convenience retailers, um, our local businesses have found innovative ways, have adapted to this crisis, and um, and sort of found ways to engage with us. So, you know, actually incurs a debt of gratitude for many of us um, to. And again, I don't think all of that will change when the world gets back to whatever normal will look like the other side of the vaccine. Um, you know, we've seen a steady sort of growth in the trend about localness. And it's obvious, I think, that all national brands need to have a local strategy. Now, that actually plays very nicely into um, you know, things like DoorDrop, a geographical based channel, to areas that are targeting catchments and localities. And indeed, within our own business, we are seeing local advertising recovering faster than national. Um, this is our screenshots from our online portal. So it's leaflet drop. And, and basically, this is our little sort of um, view into the world of door drop so it allows you to go in at a local level plot your postcode where your business is build a catchment upload some creative we'll print it we'll deliver it and it's all done you check out and pay and we're done in, in sort of 15 minutes so it's a, a sort of very simple e-commerce sort of thing yes we too have had to go digital to uh, to bridge the gap of understanding and education in this sort of space but this has had a very substantial sort of uh, success this year far better than, uh, say, our national advertisers um, who are still sort of, uh, you know, in the process of recovering or reopening. It launched in 2018. We had a very good, solid year of nearly 500% growth in volume from a low base, of course, in 2019 and had high aspirations for 2020. Not all of those have been met, but we have more than doubled the volume in spite of arguably missing the best part of half a year. So um, it has been a, a great success story, and it does show there is a lot of life in local advertising at this moment in time. So just to end, full transparency, here's our year, um, and it's been a roller coaster, as you can kind of see, and not a particularly enjoyable one either. So the blue line represents the forecast for our business, uh, for the door drop business in in um, in, uh, in 2020, where we started out, um, and you can see we started you know, fairly reasonably, fairly well. Uh, but something went horribly wrong. I hope in years to come, we'll look back on this and think, oh, what was going on there? Hopefully we'll actually forget a lot of what happened this year. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously Q2, March, April, May, and even the recovery when lockdown ended across June and July were significantly down. But since that time, since the autumn, we have actually started to see things really recover, okay? Things have really come back. Perhaps the good results we saw earlier in the year 
um, you know, we're being rewarded for those. Um, we're going to have a best ever December, ironically enough, as a, as a business, which which I wouldn't have honestly wouldn't have been able to predict had you uh, asked me probably about four or five months ago. But um, you know, it has been a, 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 a you know a very strong and sustained recovery with, as I say, an awful lot of new clients on board, trialing, testing, and finding success in this channel. At the end of the day, this hasn't escaped other people, other commentators as well. And as I started at the point of uh, trust, you know it must be true if you read it in print. Thank you very much for your time and for listening to me this morning.